Well, good morning and welcome to worship. It's good to be together in this space. And for those of you that are participating online, a, a, a good morning to you as well. We're glad that you're joining us in worshiping our loving God. As we do each week, a, a couple quick announcements. We uh, hopefully you received a Connect card. I understand we might be low on the count, so if you don't have one today, we'll make sure that we uh, get one into your hand next week. It's just a wonderful way for us to know uh, who's here, and that way we can also know who's not here, maybe be able to reach out to someone in need. Um, also, on the back of those Connect cards, there's an opportunity to provide a prayer request, and, and so we, um, we, as a staff, we collect those together, and we, we pray over the congregation. Um, Here's some announcements that we want to make sure people are aware of. So this Wednesday is considered Ash Wednesday. And on Ash Wednesday, that's the beginning of Lent. Lent is a, a season of weeks that lead up to Easter. And this year, Easter will be on April 17th. That season is intended for um, lament. That's where we grieve over the, uh, the way that not only ourselves, but the whole of the world... Uh, turns away from God, and we lament violence and injustice. So we just become keenly aware of it. We give ourselves permission, uh, and in fact, we hold ourselves accountable to be aware of that. We, all, we also <clears throat> uh, consider our own pattern of going astray from God, and, and, and we repent over that. And It's a season of really wanting to, to focus on God and, and, and making sure that our walk with Him is a sincere and authentic one. So Ash Wednesday begins that whole season. It'll be at 7 o'clock, a service in this room, and we invite you to participate in that. Um, we also want you to know of an opportunity that throughout Lent, through the time between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday, we're going to have um, daily public readings of Scripture. We'll actually read it in public once a week on Tuesdays at noon. Um, but then every day we'll take a portion of what is read publicly and provide that via YouTube in our podcast. And our hope is that throughout Lent that we would be able to gather around God's Word all season long. So together we'll be reading the books of Isaiah, and then the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Romans. We invite you, Tuesdays at noon, we'll sit and read the whole of a book uh, together, here, aloud. And then if that uh, doesn't fit into your time schedule, just know that we'll make those available again via YouTube and our podcast. We'll also live stream it on those Tuesdays as well. That's what's in your handout. You have a copy of that in your hands, and uh, hopefully you picked one up on your way in, and it just lays out how the readings will work. It's all part of being a church that is on the move, that we're a church that moves in, up, and out. It's the very way that Christ calls us to move. We move in toward each other in relationships that minister the love of Christ. We, we trust that God will move us up to transform us as we learn and live his word, and that we move out with the genuine agape care, the kind of love that Jesus had. We move out to the rest of the world, in, up, and out. We trust that even as we come to worship God, that that's what he's creating in our hearts. And on this day, as we gather, there's a passage in uh, at the beginning of Psalm 128. It's one of the psalms of a sense, the, the psalms that the uh, he Hebrews would have sung together as they made their way to Jerusalem. It begins with these words, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Blessed is everyone who, who fears the Lord, who has awe, who, who holds the Lord in honor and respect, who sees God as God has revealed himself to be. We gather not to be afraid of God, but to be in awe of him this morning. And so let's stand. And let's begin our service in song. Let's sing our Father. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Spirit conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus. 
Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. And I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Sing, I believe. I believe in you. And I believe you rose again. I believe in God our Father. And I believe in God our Father. And I believe in Christ the Son. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. And our God is three in one. And I believe in the resurrection. And that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Let's sing that, just the voices. I believe in God our Father. I believe in God our Father. And I believe in Christ the Son. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. And our God is three in one. And I believe in the resurrection. And that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus.
Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for today, for this time together, for each other. We are most grateful for Jesus, who unites us. Thank you, God, for showing love and generosity through your Son. Jesus, you came into the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, and your innocent life paid the cost. The King of all kings came to serve, washing our feet. Thank you for covering us with your love. God, show us the way to your heart and make us more like Jesus. We acknowledge our need for the Savior. Moved by the Spirit, we confess our sin. We are equally lost to sin and saved by your amazing grace as we trust in you. Forgive us, Lord, for the wrong that we do and also for the good that we should do but we choose not to. We are sorry for choosing our ways over your ways as we are silent before you. The good news is God is faithful and just. In Christ we are forgiven. Bless our congregation. Bless all people in your world. Help us to do nothing from selfish ambition, but to count others before self, looking for the interests of others. Give us the humility of Christ as he took on the form of a servant. Reassure us when we are troubled by what the future may hold. In your presence, there is comfort and peace. May we lift to you those who need your healing touch. Bob and Meredith Thorne, Beth Flanagan, Bob and Kathy Hochstetter, Fred and Bobby Prager, and all others who are on our hearts today. Prayers, Lord, for the youth and leaders at Stronghold this weekend as they connect, grow in faith, and travel home today. We trust the gift of prayer. Let it guide our hearts and minds as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who are in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, as we prepare for Lent, the beautiful season of Easter, show us the way to your heart. More of you means less of us. Fill us with Jesus. Make us more like him. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Lori. We have the privilege this morning of celebrating in baptism together. Uh, in baptism, uh, we affirm that the prime mover is always God. It matters not how much water is used. It uh, matters not if a person's dunked or splashed, but that God is the one who moves. And in trust, we, we believe that God is taking his seal and, and affirming all of his covenant promises. And as the people of God, we, we bring even our children forward and say, this is a child of the church in belief that God will be working in that child's life going forward. I even, even as we long for the day when that child in their own voice will say, yes, 
I believe in Jesus Christ and receive from him the very love of God. So this morning we have Matt and Bianca uh, Schmutz coming forward. If you'll bring Layla with you. Look at Layla. I was going to wear that exact bow. I'm going to have you guys stand right over here. And coming on behalf of the uh, congregation is Kim Smith, one of our elders. It is good to see you, your whole family. It really is. And Layla, it's really good to see you in, in bringing your daughter forward to be bat baptized today. Do you affirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, the one who is the leader of your life and the one who sets you right with God? If so, please say, we do. We do. And do you commit, promise, pledge yourselves to raising Layla in a way where she can see Christ at work in your family, where she can be engaged in the life of a congregation, where she can see patterned for her the way of Christ. Do you make that pledge this morning? Wonderful. I believe, Kim, you have a question for the congregation. Do you, as members of the church, promise to guide and nurture Layla with your words and actions and with love and with prayer? Will you encourage her to know firsthand the love of Christ and to follow Christ with all joy? And will you welcome and encourage her participation in the life of this congregation? If so, please say, we'll do and we will. We do and we will. On behalf of the session of Northminster Presbyterian Church, I present Layla Ann Schmutz to be baptized. Thanks, Kim. Layla, oh, come here. Come here, honey. Oh, such a big girl. Such a big girl. Yeah, let's look in here. What do you see here? Oh, look at this. It's a bit chilly. Layla Ann Schmutz, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Layla, there is a God who created you in his image, and we trust you into his care. That one day, yes, one day, you too with your own voice will celebrate Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Would you like a microphone? All right. I believe you have something for that. Do you mind if I walk this way, Zach? Let's walk all the way. Matt and Bianca, this lighted candle represents the light of Christ, which you have promised to nurture and encourage in Layla. We suggest that you relight this candle on each anniversary of her baptism to remember and celebrate this moment, the amazing gift of God's love and the commitments you have made. God bless you and your family. We praise God for you guys. And Layla, we praise God for you as well. And may God be with you as you go forward together as a family. Amen? All right, here you go. I believe this belongs to you. There. Awesome. Thank you. Feel free to take your seats. And Kim, thank you as well. We've uh, reached that point in our service where for those who are in third grade and younger, that uh, if you would like to uh, go and explore a uh, uh, veggie tales and spend some time in the gym and, and be encouraged. Just make your way back to, I believe it's Chris Kerr and Vicki Jordan, and they'll usher you that direction. So I believe we have a couple more going that way. Let's take a moment and greet one another. If you would please stand and, and let each other know what you're going to do with the warm weather in the coming week.
how deep how deep the father's love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was a dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? And I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Please be seated. We sent out an email yesterday to the congregation in which we invite all of you to join us in prayer for the people of Ukraine. The email included a number of things that we might be able to include in our own prayers, in our own prayer life. It also shared that on Tuesday night we will have a prayer gathering here, just a, a short little amount of time where we can combine our hearts and our voices together in one room and, and be able to lift up uh, the people of Ukraine at that time. I thought even now that we might be able to join our hearts together and seek God's uh, involvement here. Let's pray together. Father, we are aware that even in Scripture we are told that there will be times of war. Yet God, when we see the images and reflect upon the loss and the suffering, the sheer violence that's being um, experienced in that land in Ukraine, God, our, our hearts just feel the, the depth of the pain. And, and we ask, God, that your hand would be very much upon those who are vulnerable. That those who are the aggressors would be held back. That their intentions would come to no good. That, that God, in your grace and in your mercy, you would protect children and people who are defenseless. 
We ask, God, that you'd be with world leaders and grant them wisdom and courage and compassion in that right, healthy, good balance that they would be able to move forward and, and find ways that we can end the violence. We pray for all the people involved, soldiers on both sides. We want no loss of life. We pray especially for those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for their, their witness among others that you would nudge them into acts of grace and kindness, that, that they would extend hospitality, that they would honor your name in all that they do. We pray, God, that the witness of the church in this time would, would glorify you And God, you know how easy it is for us to become distracted, to get caught up with the next thing on our to-do list, to, to turn to some kind of entertainment to fill our empty spaces. Would you help to keep Ukraine in the experience of violence at the front of our minds, that we would be disciplined in our prayers, that we would lift them up without ceasing and that God we would turn to you and glorify you in the midst of all of it knowing that you are the God who saves you are the God who is trustworthy we thank you that you hear these prayers and receive them not only those spoken in this room but those spoken in each of our hearts and to you be the glory in all things in Christ's name Amen. Amen. We'd love to have you join uh, with, with others on Tuesday evening at 6, and then it'll be on Wednesday when we have our Ash Wednesday service at 7. All right. Um, hi, I'm Bob Jordan, and yes, I am a fair weather fan. It's true. It all began. I, I grew up in a house that happened to love the Dallas Cowboys. I was a big fan of the Dallas Cowboys. My parents loved them. We had Tom Landry on the sidelines, uh, Roger Staubach in uh, the position of quarterback. We had Leroy Jordan as a linebacker. We had Tony Dorsett as a running back. It, it was some good years. We, we, I loved them, and then I moved to the Bay Area out in California. And by the way, the Niners were doing pretty well. It's not that I wished any ill will on the Cowboys. It's just that, well... The Niners captured my heart. So I, I, I turned over to them, and, and it was the time of um, Joe Montana and Jerry Rice, and Dwight Clark, and Steve Young. Boy, I was a big fan. That is until I moved to Indianapolis. <laughs> and, and again, I, I, I hope that the 49ers and I can be friends. I, I, I don't want to end the friendship, but, but it was the season of Tony Dungy and and. Uh, Peyton Manning and uh, Marvin Harrison. Uh, it was just a good season, and, and I was a big fan. Yeah, I'm a fair weather fan. You see, for me, sports is simply entertainment. And so I, I, I go, and I, if I'm entertained by a certain team, then, then I'll move on from the previous team, and, and I'll just enjoy the entertainment. Now, I have learned from a number of you that you might question, but Bob, where's the loyalty? Where's the faith? You see, there's a devotion to baseball teams in this community that demonstrates commitment, faith. For those who are so committed to the home team, you might turn to me and go, how can you be a Fairweather fan? Being a Fairweather fan is nothing short of betrayal. And that's what we're going to talk about today is betrayal. Betrayal. You know, when it comes to following Jesus, we can easily be tempted toward betrayal, toward becoming a fair-weather fan. Let me just give a little bit of a big picture as we come into our, our, uh, our message today. If you recall a couple weeks ago when we began to talk about John 13, that we said that this is going to be a year where we ask as a congregation, God, what, what's next for us? What do you have next for us? 
And so we've turned to this section of John's gospel, chapters 13 through 17. It was a time where Jesus met with his closest disciples, and he helped them understand what's next. He was going to die on a cross. He was going to be raised from the dead. They would be the leaders of the church. And so in chapters 13 through 17, we have this incredible teaching from Jesus, setting his followers up for what's next. So far, what we've paid our attention to is the story of Jesus washing feet. We learned that, that we must be the served, that Jesus came to, to serve us, that the washing of the feet became a, a little bit of a story that, that Jesus serves his followers. Peter said, no, don't, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus said, listen, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have anything uh, with me. He said, wash all me, and Jesus goes, no, I don't need to wash all of you. Come on, if I wash your feet, it's enough. And that Jesus, his death on the cross is both necessary and sufficient. We need to be served by him. And then we found out that it's also, the foot washing is also an example. Jesus said, I have provided you an example. You need to be the servants as well. A servant is not greater than his master. And if I've washed feet, you need to go and wash feet in the world in all kinds of ways, serve others. Well, this morning we come to the part that we've been intimating along the way. You see, we've heard tell of Judas throughout each week. He's come up in our passages, and so this morning we'll talk about Judas, the sellout. Our passage is John chapter 13, verses 21 through 30. I encourage you to open up the Bibles you brought with you. Make use of the ones we have in the rows. If you're at home and you want to go grab your Bible, that would be awesome too. We'll put it on the screen. Hear the word of God. John 13, verse 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas, was, that Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast. Or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. And it was night. May God bless the reading of his word and may God show his favor upon our time together as well. Today we'll talk about Judas. We'll talk about betrayal. We'll talk about blame. And at the end we'll capture up what are the lessons we're to learn or what are some of the lessons we can learn from this passage. So Judas, betrayal, blame, and then some lessons. So let's first talk about Judas Here's what we know about Judas. You know, when, when you're in high school and you get your yearbook, um, uh, so for me that was a long time ago, but when I got my yearbook, and if you're a senior, they list your activities right underneath your name. You're not much space. Your whole four years summed up in just a, a little bit of a, a space. Now, I know yearbooks today, parents take out pages and whole pages, and they tell the whole story of their kids and pictures and all kinds. But when I, in my day, it was just that little, little space. That's pretty much all that we get about Judas. <laughs> we're not really told a whole lot. People make conjectures based on what we're told, but the information could fit under his senior picture in his high school yearbook. So here's what we know. He's Simon's son. Even our text tells us that. Judas is Simon. He's the son of Simon Iscariot. We don't know anything about Simon. So all we can say is that he's Simon's son. Then there's that word Iscariot. So it applies to his dad, but, but it, we can also read Judas Iscariot. There's at least four different ideas people count, that walk away with what this word could possibly mean. And it's because they take the word and they look at the, how the word is made up and what it could possibly mean um, uh, 
uh, as it's written in the text. And so one of them could be that this is Judas, a man from Kerioth. Like it's a reference to the place he's from. Judas, a man from Kerioth. By the way, there's at least two options that we could choose for Kerioth. Another possible meaning of Iscariot is that it's a liar. That here's Judas, a liar, a traitor, a, a betrayer. That could be a meaning if you take the word and you try to do some history uh, investigation on it. There was a link to an Old Testament passage, an Old Testament story that could connect with that. I did see an ar- argument from a couple of scholars that, that it could mean a dyer, like someone who dyes uh, textiles, fabric. And then there are others that hold that it means a dagger bearer. Like someone who would be a zealot, someone who would, who would have a dagger within, within their cloak and, and that they want to have an armed revolt, that this is a, a person who's passionate about overta- overthrowing the Romans, that this would be a term meaning dagger bearer. Simon's son, Iscariot, we're not quite sure what it means, but we are told that he's one of the twelve. This is fascinating. That Jesus, in the choosing of just 12 humans to be his disciples, there were other people following, there were other people under the broader description of disciples, but, but in that 12, that one of them was Judas. It, when you go back in the, in the Gospels and, and you look at how Judas is, is introduced, as he's, as he's listed among the other disciples, you'll see this common then little thing afterwards, a little uh, parenthesis after uh, Uh, Judas, who was to betray him. But Jesus chose him. In fact, we know that Jesus turned to his twelve and said, hey, listen, it's not that you chose me, but I chose you. So that means that Judas was there when Jesus touched a leper and healed him, when when Jesus healed a a blind person, when Jesus calmed the storm, when Jesus fed the 5,000 or the 4,000, that Judas was there in all of those situations. He was one of the 12. We find out that he's the treasurer of the group, um, that he carried the money bag. There's one other little item we find out about him, and this comes from the uh, first eight verses of chapter 12 in John's gospel. Um, There's a story there of the anointing of Jesus, that Mary anoints Jesus with this expensive expensive ointment, and and that Judas speaks up against it. In fact, uh, we have these words uh, in chapter 12, verses 4 and 6. Listen to this. Watch what happens here. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, one of Jesus' disciples, who was about to betray him. See, we have those two items. One of his disciples who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And then we have this commentary. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. The reason why I find this interesting is because we know the Gospels are written some decades after Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead. So some decades afterwards. So they're looking back at the, at the story, and they're telling the story for us. And it's so interesting as we read through the Gospels that there's no other comment. It's not like he was introduced as Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus and was a thief. There's no other comment except for this one place that he was a thief. And when we get to finding the response of the other disciples to uh, Jesus said that one of you betrayed me, it's not like they all said, It's got to be Judas, he's a thief. But here in that one place, that's how he's described. That's what we would find under his name in the yearbook. That's Judas. So let's talk a little bit about his betrayal. When we began our passage, we found that at the very beginning it said, after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. Troubled in his spirit. And testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. There was a a situation just prior to this, again at the end of chapter 12, where Jesus was troubled in his spirit. It's in John's uh, expression of what we find at the Garden of Gethsemane and the other Gospels. And so in chapter 12, verses 27 and 28, we find Jesus saying these words. 
Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. Jesus' heart was troubled when he was considering all that was before him. His death on the cross his payment of sin for all of humanity. As as Jesus is looking into what what has to happen, he asks, should I say to the Father, remove this? He seeks the glory of God. His heart was troubled. So when we come to him bringing out this identity of Judas, of, of letting Judas take the next step, we find that Jesus' heart is troubled again. In fact, the way he says the next line, amen, amen, truly, truly, In other words, I I want you all to hear this. I don't want any of you to miss this. One of you is going to betray me. When you look at the response of the disciples, it's so interesting. I I love that we have four Gospels because it's like we have four different windows into the same experience. And the four different windows allow us to see the same experience from different angles. When you read Matthew and Mark about this moment, it says that, that the disciples turn to Jesus and each one of them asks, is it I, Lord? Like, like they're a little concerned. In, in Luke and then a little bit in John, we have more of the senses that they looked around. <laughs> is it that guy? It's like when you're taking an abnormal psych class and you begin to read through it and you see yourself in, in every description as, as they lay out what people really go through in the hard part. You start to read it. Is this me? And then you start thinking, this so describes my family, or my friends. And and in that situation, hear the disciples going, is it I? Is it one of these? In Judah's case, we find that the disciples thought the best of him. In verse 29, we say some thought that that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, go and buy more food. Or give some to the poor. It's not like in this situation, as they're describing it, it's not like the disciples go, oh, I bet you Jesus is telling them off for being a thief. They thought the best of him at that moment. Then we find that Jesus says, well, first there's this little description. I love this little description. Because they're at this low table. And if you've been in a Bible class before, if you've heard sermons on this, you've probably heard this, that the table would be a low table. And the people would be lying down in this particular situation on their left arm and their feet would be out away from the table and, and um, they would be eating with their right hand. And that meant that all the disciples would be lined up uh, right in front of each other. And that the place of honor would be right in front of Jesus as they're lying down. And we're introduced to the disciple whom Jesus loved. And by the way, that's a whole other conversation. We don't have time for that today of who that person is. But I love that Peter, Peter is not in the place of honor. So Peter is, in fact, not even next to the person who's in the place of honor Peter has to motion him. Hey! And then he kind of motions to him, ask ask Jesus. He can't even do the cross yet because that didn't happen. Um, But he's got a motion to him, ask Jesus who this is. And Jesus gives a response. It is he to whom I give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. We need to pause and understand that moment. Here is the bread of life giving bread to Judas. In that kind of environment, in that context, in that time and place, that would have been an act of honor, of of intimate connection, of reaching out to another and honoring the host giving you the bread, the bread of life who said, listen, whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst again. The bread of life giving bread to to Judas. You wonder, you wonder at that moment, what if, what if Judas said thank you and in all of, all humility he confessed his intention and he repented. What if in that moment, that moment of the offering of bread, there was a whole change? And we know that God had already determined that, that there was going to be a death and that Jesus would die for all of humanity. We know that that was all. But what if in that moment, Jesus reaching out? I 
we're told that as Judas takes the morsel, that at that time Satan enters him. And Jesus tells him, what you're going to do, do quickly. It was indeed the moment of decision for Judas. Jesus' words are interesting. It leaves it open. What you're going to do, do quickly. Would it be Judas the betrayer or Judas the repenter? I've always found it interesting that we've got the story of Judas and his betrayal, but we also have the story of Peter and his denial. So even as Jesus calls Judas out for betraying him, he also calls Peter out for denying him ahead of time. He, he says, listen, you're going to deny me. And Je Peter goes, not me. I'm, I, uh, not me. He goes, listen, you're going to deny me three times. And, and truly, he does. Surely, it, it goes forth that way. Jesus in being interrogated, and Peter's out in the courtyard, and people go, you're one of them, aren't you? You're one of them. You're a follower of his. And, and Peter goes, no, I'm not. Three times. Listen, when we look at the story of Judas, we find that after the event, after Jesus is killed on the cross, Judas has remorse. He has remorse. He goes back and he returns the money. He was given 30 silver coins, a really small amount of money, according to scholars. He gives back the money. He has remorse over what he had done. But the difference between Judas, at least in the way it's described in the story, that the difference between Judas and Peter is that Peter not only has remorse, but he has a longing to be reconnected with Jesus. He stays in community. He's there for Jesus at, at, as Jesus is raised from the dead, that, that he comes back. He wants to know. He wants to reconnect. That longing, remorse and a longing. Judas's remorse was built around that he had broken a law, that he participated in the shedding of innocent blood. But there's nothing told of a longing to be reconnected with Christ. One who was so close to Jesus. In Luke's telling of the story, there's this part in chapter 22, verses 21 and 22. I'll put the passage up on this slide. Um, it says, uh, this is Jesus talking, but behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. Again, that's a statement of intimacy. The hand's not hiding behind, holding a dagger. It's, it, it's the hand is on the table, sharing in the meal. And, and for a meal, this is fellowship and community. The hand that's going to betray me is on the table. But then we're told, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Which leads us to talk then next about blame. Woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. When we talk about blame, do you know that in physics there's something they call, and I'm sure that a lot of you already know this, that, that in physics there's something they call the triple point. It's where a substance can exist in uh, thermodynamic equilibrium as a solid, a liquid, and a gas. So there's this point where you've got three things that, that uh, three different versions of one substance, you can have it as a solid, liquid, and gas at the right pressure and temperature. So for instance, for H2O, water, for H2O, we know that, that just above freezing and at a really low pressure, uh, we can have ice, solid, water, liquid, and steam, gas, existing in thermodynamic equilibrium. It, if you want to know the stats more directly, it's 273.16 degree, degree Kelvin in an atmospheric pressure of 6.1173 millibars. All right, so you will be tested uh, on the way out. A triple point. Well, we could say we have a triple point here going on in the story of Judas. We have three responsible forces involved in the working out of history in this moment. We're told in the passage that Satan entered him. That the evil one, the, the adversary, the one that stands against God, that this, this being, this evil being entered Judas at that moment. Yet we're also told in Scripture that, 
that just because Satan's there doesn't mean that, that everything is then lost. We know that we're told that, you know, if you resist the devil, he will flee you. We know the story of Jesus, that Jesus, fully God, fully human, that he's tempted by the devil, but he doesn't succumb. So Satan is there. Yes, Satan and works against God, that there's this evil, there's this evil entity working against God. We know that Jesus is there. Jesus is the one who says, what you're going to do, do quickly. He's already said, this is determined. The sovereign God, God, the second person of the Trinity, fully God, fully human, in the flesh, is present there and says, what you're going to do, do quickly. This is God's overall plan of salvation. I love the way Augustine put it. He put, he put it this way. He goes, unless Christ had handed himself over, no one could have handed Christ over. Do you get that? Unless Christ had handed himself over, no one could have handed Christ over. So we have Satan there. We've got Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, fully God, fully human. And then we have Judas. And Judas is no pawn between a power of evil and, and the full power of God. He's no pawn. He's very much a contributor He's the one who sought out a deal with the religious authorities. He's the one who took the money. He's the one who guided the soldiers to that spot where Jesus would be. It's a triple point. The sovereign hand of God, the presence of evil, and the sin of a man. So if we look at all this, Judas, betrayal, blame, what might be some lessons we can take away? I think among them are these. The first one is this. Proximity to Christ does not always indicate faith in Christ. This is a really important one for us to grapple with today. Proximity with Christ does not always indicate faith in Christ. Judas was one of the twelve. He hung out with Jesus. He was there at all those times where Jesus did amazing things. And we might be there too. We might, we might be weekly attenders in worship. We might, we might belong to a church. We might be daily readers of Scripture. But we can be capable of betrayal. I was thinking about what are some modern day examples of selling Jesus out. And I think these are, can be quite common ways of selling Jesus out today. We can sell Jesus out to our political party or our political leanings. Let's say we happen to be conservative and we can possibly run that, that we're going to unite somehow Jesus with, with our understanding of what rights are, individual rights, or, or our, our, our love of being able to hold on to uh, uh, weapons and we'll, we'll connect Jesus and guns somehow or, or carrying the American flag or whatever flag of our country. And we'll, we'll unite them together and we'll sell Jesus out to the values of our political leaning course it can be true on the other side of the political spectrum as well that we can sell Jesus out to some if we're uh, on the progressive side we could say that there's there's this beautiful understanding of the openness of humanity and, and the self-fulfillment of the individual and that's what love is and I'm going to I'm going to sell Jesus out for this this picture of universal love among humanity and we sell the Jesus of the Bible the Jesus who is out to our political leanings we can sell Jesus out to our friends Oh, we can be about Jesus when we're by ourselves or when we're at church, but when we go to our friends, we just sell Jesus out. This is a non-domain for Jesus. Jesus, you, you don't belong here. I'm going to go the way of my friends. We can sell Jesus out to our culture. We can sell Jesus out to our desire for comfort. Jesus, I'm all for you. Just don't make life hard. Jesus, I'm all for you, but I'm also for my 401k in my retirement years, or the expanse of my education for my own ends. We can sell Jesus out. The opportunity exists. Proximity to Christ does not always indicate faith in Christ. So what do we do with that? We hold ourselves accountable to the Jesus of Scripture. We gather like this, and we say, let's, let's encourage each other. Let's, let's remind each other. We come under Scripture. Jesus, who are you? What does it look like to follow you? I don't want to sell you out. I don't want the Jesus of my culture. I want the Jesus who is. That's the Jesus I want to follow. 
the second thing we can learn is that it's possible to sell out Jesus thinking we're doing so in God's name. You know, if we go with the story that, that Judas was a zealot of some kind and, and he was impatient with Jesus and he knew better than Jesus did about what God wanted in the world and he wanted Rome to be overthrown. And so he goes to, to get Jesus out of the way so that he could be about God's agenda in this world. If we go with that interpretation of the story, we could see that there's this connection with the, that sometimes we'll, we'll cast Jesus aside, we'll sell him out and think that we're doing this in God's name. Here's what it looks like throughout history. One way we do that is we circle the wagons. We go, well, we, at least we got Jesus, and we just point our finger over the wagons at the culture around us, and we judge them. And we judge them. We think we're doing this all in God's name, but the Jesus of the Bible is not a Jesus who circles the wagon. The Jesus of the Bible goes, love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. That we would give witness to Jesus as the servant, and we would be servants of others. And sometimes, instead of circling the wagons, we come above culture, and we go, well, let's just not get involved in anything, and we'll just remain above it. And, and yet Jesus calls us to be salt and light in the midst of the world. You see, it's, it's possible to sell Jesus thinking that we're doing it in God's name. Here's a, a third item. Remorse over our acts of denial and longing for restored intimacy with Christ are welcomed by him. This is good news. Listen, there can be patterns of betrayal in any one of our lives, in my life as well, all of us, that we can be selling Jesus out somewhere along in our life. But this is the good news, that remorse over our acts of denial, even betrayal, that that when we combine that with longing, we're saved by grace. We, we're, we don't have to create our salvation. It's provided. But our response is one of, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. I live for you. Maybe a final one would be this. Jesus keeps coming toward us in love even when we are on the pre precipice of sinning and he restores us as we return to him. Listen, he comes to us. He offers us that bread. He's there. He goes, listen, even when you're tempted, there will always be a way out. That, that, that you, will, you will not experience a temptation that, that, that you, you can't stand up against or that, that there won't be a way out. That he's coming to us. He comes to us with a morsel of bread. You're my child. Trust in me. Follow me. It really calls us to have an awareness. Keep coming back under Scripture. In the end, it won't matter which sports team we're loyal to. Now, I know if you're a Cardinals fan or a Cubs fan, maybe a White Sox fan, you would argue that. But in the end, it won't matter which sports team we're loyal to. What matters every day and for all of eternity is our loyalty to and dependence upon Christ. His death saves us. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we earn our salvation. He gives it freely but our response is one of loyalty and dependence. And what we do is we refer to that combination of loyalty and dependence as faith. And what a home team it is. Father, Son, and Spirit. One God and you. Father, Son, and Spirit and you. Father, Son, and Spirit, you and all of us together. What a home team. That we're not fair-weather friends when it comes to knowing Christ to following Christ. But we're his committed followers. G Judas would not yield to Jesus. He would not return to him. He would not trust. He had remorse, but he did not have faith. God gives you the gift of faith that we would be devoted to him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the story of Judas. More so, we thank you that that Jesus died for us and that we would have new life through him. God, you know our own tendencies toward betrayal. You know of ways that we've probably patterned it in some of the way we just act normally and we call it normal. Would you confront us with the good news of who Jesus really is? Would you awaken us a, a, a return to the Jesus of Scripture? That as you answer the question for us of what's next, that we would follow Jesus as Jesus has revealed himself to be. 
God, I pray for everyone in this room, everyone watching online, that if anyone senses that, they're, that they think that they're too lost, Father, would you reassure them that you come toward them, that Jesus goes toward them, that you offer them a morsel, the bread of life. And may all of us accept that and, and come rushing back to you that we would be counted among Christ's followers and that you would be glorified. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. In the crushing and in the pressing you are making new wine. And in the sore light I surrender you are breaking new ground so I yield to you into your careful hand when I trust in you I don't need to understand so make me your vessel make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine. heart is in an open space to welcome the very leading of Christ in that space. Thanks for being here in worship today. And, and it may be that you have questions that came up from what we talked about or maybe something in a song. And let's keep those conversations going. Reach out to the people around you. Contact us on staff. We would love to engage in those conversations. This morning, we have classes for kids out this direction. We've got um, classes for adults in different places in the church. Our youth classes are postponed until next week because of the retreat that the youth are on. So keep praying them, uh, for them throughout today. You are loved. You are loved. Let's go into this world and share the love of God with others. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.